Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you. Hello and welcome to Self Inflicted Oral Nostalgia, the Guided by Voices podcast, every GBV LP, every two weeks. My name is Jeff Gomez, and today we're looking at the second of two records to come out in 2014 Cool Planet. But first, as usual, all music heard in this podcast is played and owned by Guided by Voices. Any reviews or materials cited are owned by their respective creators. And of course, many thanks goes out to Jeff Warren's Guided by Voices database, which you really should visit at gbvdb.com. Go to my site, everygbvlp.com, to subscribe to future episodes or to listen to past episodes of this podcast. And drop me a line with corrections, suggestions, or thoughts at jeff at everygbvlp.com. Now let's get to the show. So with today's episode, we mark the end of the GBV reunion that began back in 2010 when the group got back together to play the Matador 21 Festival and then stayed together to produce six records in three years. The one we'll talk about today, Cool Planet, was the last of those six LPs. That being said, as I mentioned in the last episode, the closest thing that GBV has to an original drummer, Kevin Fennell, had been kicked out of the group after recording the last album, Motivational Jumpsuit. For this record, he was replaced by Kevin March. March was ecstatic when he got Pollard's call saying that to go back and do that again was unexpected, but I embraced it with open arms. He also said that playing and guided by voices was one of the best times of my life playing music. He was a great asset to the band and since he's still with the band, he continues to be a great asset, especially since his two contributions to double record August by Cake, Overloaded and Sentimental Wars were absolute highlights. But his addition to the group in 2014 threw the concept and idea of what this era of GBV was out of whack. Because you had guys who'd been there from the 80s like Mitch Mitchell and Tobin Sprout playing with March who didn't enter the scene until much later. You could no longer call this the classic lineup, the guys who'd recorded B-1000 or Under the Bushes, Under the Stars. Instead, you had kind of a hybrid that began to not make much sense. And if you couldn't bill it as the classic lineup, then why have some of these other guys in the group? Did the combination make sense anymore? Were they running out of gas? You could begin to sense this tension in the band's shows on the Cool Planet Tour, like there's a clip on YouTube of them playing Authoritarian Zoo at a club in Pennsylvania. This prompts Bob to introduce the song and sing the first line as Philadelphia Zoo. And while the band sounds fine, you can sort of see the cracks that are starting to appear. Sprout, who I love, stands pretty much motionless, giving his Telecaster gentle strums. Mitch Mitchell's doing his usual power chord thing, while Greg Demos does his rock moves, which, well, let's just say they're the rock moves he'd been doing for years. Meanwhile, new guy Kevin March is pounding away in the background, grinning and happy to be there. And Bob just seems sort of stuck in the middle. The guys from the old lineup have sort of a been there, done that vibe. And then there's this new player who's just absolutely kicking ass. It's kind of an odd thing to see, and it was becoming apparent to audiences and critics that maybe the lineup had grown a bit stale. Pitchfork described a GBV show from around this time as being workmanlike, which is something I think you can see in the Philadelphia show. They also described the band as playing with a cold, canned efficiency, which was a long way toward the era of confusion and chaos that Robert Pollard and company once brought to their music. So it's no wonder to me that the band broke up on this tour. That meant canceling a dozen dates, including hometown shows in Dayton and Cleveland, but when Bob has an idea or a hunch, he just follows it. As he said after he'd pulled the plug, it was tired collectively. I don't know why, and I'm not blaming anyone specifically, but we seemed to be going through the motions toward the end. I couldn't see it progressing, getting any better, or going any further, so I decided it was time to wrap it up. In 2014, in addition to the two GBV records, Pollard also released a Circus Devils album and another Teenage Guitar record. And since the previous year saw him release two solo records, but there were none this year, he was probably also just itching to go and do something on his own again, or just plain work with some other people. In fact, the following year, he'd keep Kevin March around and team up with Daytonian multi-instrumentalist Nick Mitchell for three Ricked Wiki records. 
And while fans were still lapping up the new GBV records, and I count myself in this group, I think Cool Planet's actually a pretty good record. The reunion had also seemed to run its course with the critics. Pitchfork gave Cool Planet the lowest grade of all the reunion LPs, a 6.2, which was down from the highs of the 7.3 awarded to both The Bears for Lunch and Motivational Jumpsuit. They wrote, Where GBV's slovenly, dilapidated grandeur once felt vital and radical, it now putters along crankily, the sound of a band muttering to itself rather than playing to anyone in particular, themselves included. Website Exclaim graded the record a bit higher, giving it a 7 and writing that because it was recorded in a studio, the LP had a more refined sound and a well-rounded lyrical structure. Paste Magazine wrote that the record had a few outright failures, but that most of the record was pleasantly competent, saying that most songs have at least one moment or part that stands out. That seems to me to be either damning with faint praise or else just plain letting the band off the hook. The review also calls the group essentially a nostalgia act. Pop Matters, however, liked the album, writing that Cool Planet is another satisfying entry in that it reminds us that, despite all the expectations and known quantities that go into a Guided by Voices record, there's still a freshness to the approach and energy to the songs that keeps us coming back. The return of Kevin March wasn't the only new thing about the record. For the first time since getting back together, the LP, except of course for Tobin's stuff, which he recorded at his house in Michigan, was recorded in one studio, a new location in his hometown that Paul had just discovered. As he told Rolling Stone, Cybertechnics has been around in Dayton for 50 years, and the guy who owns and operates it is Phil Mahaffey. He's great. He looks like George Martin. We just discovered him in his studio last year, and that's a shame that it didn't happen sooner. The band would record Cool Planet at this studio, in addition to the Ricked Wiki records the following year. This is also where Pollard would record the all-in-his-own GBV album, Please Be Honest. The studio features a ton of analog gear, including an Electrodyne mixing console that used to reside at the famous Sigma Sound Studios in Philadelphia. This is where David Bowie recorded most of Young Americans. Studio owner Mahaffey is a Dayton local who started playing music in 1953 as a session pianist for country artists. He sort of fell into owning the studio and only later obtained his recording and engineering chops. Over the years, the studio has been home to sessions from all kinds of bands, funk, bluegrass, and a couple of local indie bands such as Brainiac. In an article in the Dayton Daily News from 2015, written by none other than former GBB drummer Don Thrasher, Mahaffey said, A lot of musicians shoot themselves in the foot because they record at home. The sound is everything, but they spend way too much time on the computer trying to get things to sound right. This is funny because, while that may be true for some people, that's not at all Pollard's problem. But Mahaffey follows this up by adding, I'm not saying it's terrible, but there's a place right here in Dayton with a pro board and two-inch tape recorder. As long as the band comes in here tight, I can knock out a whole album in a day. Now that sounds more like Bob. So it's pretty fun to think of Pollard hooking up with this septuagenarian Steve Albini. I'll talk more about their working relationship in the episode on Please Be Honest. The cover for Cool Planet is really nice, featuring a Pollard collage which, the same as Motivational Jumpsuit, features a contemporary photograph, this time a picture Pollard took of a store that had gone out of business, along with his usual vintage found art. The blue and pink at the top of the sleeve is also really arresting, and matching pink shirts with blue type were sold on the subsequent tour. The record's title comes from the fact that it was, according to the original release notes, conceived during the sub-freezing polar vortex of 2014. And while polar vortex is just a cool term, which I could actually see being used as a polar side project, it's also a real thing. It's basically when air from the North Pole gets pushed south by a low-pressure system. And actually, there are two vortices at the North and South Pole. But you generally hear the term in the singular, meaning the vortex to the north, since that's the one that has an effect on the U.S. In the winter of 2013 and 2014, huge swaths of Canada and America saw extremely cold weather, with the average temperature for all of the U.S. sinking to 17 degrees on January 6, 2014. Over 200 million Americans were affected, and there were over a dozen deaths. 
All of that being said, polar vortex has also become a buzzword which gets constantly misused. According to a story on the ABC News website, if we called every push of cold air the polar vortex, it would lose its meaning and not be accurate. If the actual polar vortex was moving over the United States, we would have a much bigger planetary problems to deal with. Maybe meteorologists will then come up with an additional term for these kinds of storms. Maybe cool planet? Either way, let's now look at the album track by track. The record kicks off with Authoritarian Zoo. This is a good opening song, except Pollard's a bit out of tune on the verses, and the track really doesn't get going until the chorus. But when it finally kicks in, it sounds pretty large and is a lot of fun. It also reminds me of the song Mobility, which would appear the following year as one of the first Ricked Wiki singles. One of the best things about the track is Kevin March's drumming, which sounds great. His fills really add a lot. The second song is Fast Crawl. Yeah, it's a fast crawl. Have another good ball. Have a one for the road. Big fall on your face. It's a quick pace. The placement of this song is the second track on the record. It's kind of baffling. Like when Paul had wanted to put Death Trot and Warlock riding a rooster as the second song on B-1000 before being talked into replacing it with Buzzers and Dreadful Crows. Because this song kind of kills any momentum the LP gained from the first track. The lyrics are also pretty standard fare, with Bob writing, Have one for the road, big fall in your face. That's not exactly a parody, but it's something we've heard before. And while Fast Crawl is a sort of clever oxymoron, it's not clever enough to save the song. Pitchfork, in the review of Cool Planet, said this track spoons out meandering sludge and unsavory lumps. That captures the essence of this and a few other tracks on this record, like pretty much every one of the reunion LPs, it's a record that would have been better to have just 13 or 14 songs. Third up is Psychotic Crush. The first Tobin Sprout song on the record is a Bowie-esque ripper that's about as close as you can come to Ziggy Stardust without putting on a unitard. And while that's a lot of fun, it's awfully short and feels a bit ramshackle. If Toby would have made it a bit longer and really locked down the groove, I think it would be a more effective song. The next track is Costume Makes the Man. A cigarette straight thing crowd the track This is a really gorgeous song that, while simple, that has just an acoustic guitar, some droney church organ, and a bit of electric guitar at the end, is really effective. Pollard sounds great, especially when he doubles his vocals. A couple of the tracks on this record, for me anyway, have pretty sloppy singing by Pollard, but this one sounds just wonderful. This track is also a fine example of how Bob creates so much melody on top of what are pretty much ordinary chord sequences, like the way he sings, Killing the Letter I Left, is downright magical. And it's these little touches that transform what's a quiet, almost folk song to being something really memorable. The title's also a nice pun on the phrase, Clothes Make the Man. Pollard may be implying that it's not how we dress that's important, but rather it's who we pretend to be that makes or explains us. As a phrase, clothes make the man has been around for hundreds of years, going all the way back to the Middle Ages. Various writers have used some version of it in their work, from Shakespeare to Mark Twain, the latter quipping, clothes make the man, naked people have little or no influence on society. Moving on, we have Hat of Flames. See him 
the AV Club wrote of this song that it feels most like it could have hailed from the band's heyday, 92 seconds of simple razor-hewn pop about some mysterious magical interloper coming through town in that titular hat. Guy Fieri, maybe? I pretty much agree with that. If I'd had more tape hiss and a snippet of another song at the beginning, I could see this being on one of the many EPs the band put out in 1994. Next up is These Dunes. These dunes A hurried bird's eye At Sturgeon Temple The opening of this song is very reminiscent of You Must Keep It Coming, the B-side of the Everywhere With Helicopter single. It's even sort of linked with the theme of that song since in You Must Keep It Coming, Pollard asked, what's more important, the run or the finish? Whereas here he snipes, you technically win the race. It's a pretty bare song, with half of it being just Bob singing against an electric guitar. When the drums come in at a minute into the song, that's all that comes in. So even though the track gets a bit of life in its second section, it doesn't add up to much of a song. Side one starts to wind down with Table at Fool's Tooth. Your love is in jail, whispering for and This short and punchy song was one of the singles for the record, and beyond sporting a great Pollard title, it's a really fun track, with Kevin March once again channeling Keith Moon with a whole lot of cymbal crashes. Pop Matters wrote of the track that Table at Fool's Tooth builds thick rock textures back and forth between towering chords and rundown fills, but the start and stop song cuts off before it ever gets going. The denial works though, creating a series of impressive strikes without ever settling down. The review also cites Bob's songs from the LP as being restless. That seems an apt description since a whole lot of Pollard's tracks on Cool Planet disappear just as fast as they arrive as if Bob was impatient to just get on to the next one, rather than really explore the possibilities of the one he's currently singing. Second to last song on side one is All American Boy. This Tobin Sprout track is the record's longest song at 3 minutes and 45 seconds. For the first two minutes, it's a rocking track with piano and a lead guitar line that sees Toby singing and yelping like the last couple of minutes of Hey Jude. For a guy who usually sings barely above a whisper, it's a lot of fun to hear Sprout howl. Lyrically, the song seems indebted to Springsteen's stable of working class dreamers, the factory workers and trams who were born to run, Tobin writing. I ran half-baked with a broken hearts, stealing my way to my shell, where I could dream and plan for all my broken schemes, where the rattle of the guitar shakes my brain. This is a subject that runs through songs like I Am a Scientist to Rock and Roll by the Velvet Underground, the ability of rock music to offer an escape from a humdrum existence. But of course, since this is GBV you're talking about, you're going to need a little more than just music. So Toby also pairs a rock tune with a stiff drink, writing, I poured a shot into a paper cup and washed down the tears as the stones played. And again, what Bob and others have championed, and what Sprout's talking about here, is the ability of rock and roll and that special tune that you love to fill up your very soul. It's not just for fun and it's not just loud. This stuff really means something. And of course, what the Stones means to Sprout, Sprout and GBV mean to us. Because yeah, while a lot of us are in it for that great party that's supposed to last for the rest of our lives, I think most of us like this band for expressly the reasons that Tobin's talking about here. It helps us get our heads around a crazy and fucked up world, and that's no small feat. What's also great about this song is that two minutes in, we go from the end of Hey Jude to the beginning of Let It Be, with all of the instruments falling away until what we're left with is just Sprout singing and playing softly on a piano. He mostly repeats the first verse, except this time around, he's tired and defeated. Whereas in the opening lines, he was on his way to a better place, later in the song, his fate is now sealed. 
It's just a great song and I'd say one of Sprout's very best. Last song on the side one is You Get Every Game. Ask the rising sun I'll take a curtain For the first minute of this two-minute song, Pollard does his usual lo-fi thing, singing nonsense lyrics over strums whose chords appear to have been chosen at random. But the last minute finds Tobin and Bob harmonizing over some droning keyboard and acoustic guitar. It's a nice end, though I can't say that the whole song does much for the record. First song on side two is Pan Swimmer. This is a fun track, which is another great example of how a one minute song can feel like a whole journey. That being said, I have no idea what it's about. The lyrics mention the Virgin Mary twice and Pollard repeats looking at you a bunch of times. What all that adds up to, I don't know, but it sounds good. The song was played often during the tour that followed the release of the record and with short tracks like this, you can easily see how GBB packs dozens upon dozens of songs into their marathon sets. Second song on side two is The Bone Church. This is a weird song that finds Tobin Sprout sounding more like Black Sabbath than his usual Beatles. The song's built on another heavy riff, same as Psychotic Crush from Side One, except here it's slower and darker. The song's actually a co-write with Mitch Mitchell, who seems like he's learned a Sabbath riff or two in his time, so maybe he's the one who came up with that. There's also a nice bass line. The song seems to be about fallen comrades, Sprout writing in the opening lines, I am sad for my soldier friends, assuming this is last rites. The bone church of the title alludes to a place where these soldiers, if not being the site of their demise, will end up being their final resting place. Later in the song, Tobin employs a Polaridian turn of phrase, mimicking both Bob's wordplay and his sometimes cynical outlook, writing, Know your pieces of fate. Pieces of eight used to be a form of currency. Made out of silver and originating out of Spain, pieces of eight began to be used all across the world. Pieces of Eight is also the name of a 1978 record by pop prog band Styx. This is the LP that featured the single Blue Collar Man. It also has a cool cover by longtime Pink Floyd collaborators Hypnosis. With Sprouts changing in the phrase to Pieces of Fate, Tobin's acknowledging the erratic and often unfair nature of life. Who lives or dies, whether it's in war or peace, all comes down to luck and the whims of fate. Tobin's narrator is the one standing in the bone church, while some of his fellow soldiers are buried in the soil, but it just as easily could have been the other way around. He's also, by citing a currency no longer in existence, saying that life and death is cheap. Third song on side two is Bad Love is Easy to Do. Pop Matters wrote of this song that it's the band's most effortless pop song of the last four years, just pure hooks and perfect melodies, and Pollard and Sprout seem to delight in trading off through the track. I totally agree that it's a really fun song, although the sound of it's a bit thin. Kevin March's drums sound great and he turns in a really good performance, but it sounds like there's just one guitar on the track and the bass is either mixed so low that you can't hear it, or else there's no bass line at all, so the track, for as good as it is, sounds a bit thin. Lyrically, the song's a lot of fun since it turns a whole genre of pop music on its head, namely, the love song. The charts are full of all kinds of tracks about romance and true love, but Pollard's having none of it. Here he's saying that bad love is not only just as prevalent than good, or true love, but that it's easy to do. I've compared Pollard with his quick and cynical wit more than once to Morrissey, and this is another song that would fit right in, lyrically anyway, on a Smiths record. Next up is The No Doubters. You find out who's looking, they may rip your heart out, always one new condition. When you guess the game. 
On this slow song, Pollard's singing is flat in a few places. However, March sounds great again on the drums. The lyrics are interesting, Bob making a bit of a political statement, writing here that the no-doubters are doers and shouters. This reminds me of the famous Yeats line, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are filled with passionate intensity. People who don't doubt, or who don't question either their own beliefs or what's happening around them, are often, as Pollard says here, the ones who make the most noise. This can, in turn, end up causing the most trouble. Unfortunately, you see that a lot in the divisive politics that are currently rivening America. And again, Pollard's cynical side shows here since he offers us no easy way out from the situation, instead declaring with resignation, it's always the same. Moving on, it's narrated by Paul. Take my life, I'm going. Take my arms, I'm shaking. She is the one that makes... This Tobin Sprout track is absolutely gorgeous. And the same as the second half of All American Boy, the song finds Sprout channeling the Paul McCartney who wrote Hey Jude and Let It Be. In fact, the title, narrated by Paul, is probably a nod to McCartney. Tobin's obviously a fan of the Beatles, as is Bob. Sprout even has a much more overt Beatles reference later on this record with the song Ticket to Hide. The next track is Cream of Lung. Sour days, sunshine and beats in my eyeball. I keep secrets. In the same review I quoted before, Pitchfork wrote that Pollard barely shows up on Cream of Lung, a dull muddle that sounds as lively as if it were recorded while he brushed his teeth. I have to agree, and even though the song picks up in the last 30 seconds, it's not enough to justify the first 45 seconds of the song, which sounds like Pollard making up lyrics on the spot and not really striking gold. And, for the record, Cream of Lung is Campbell's least popular soup. Third song from the end is Males of Wormwood Mars. This is a good song, but it's another one on which the band sounds like a three-piece. I can only hear one guitar, drums, and vocal. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it makes the song sound more like a demo than a finished track, although that line's always hard to find when it comes to GPB. The strides that the band had made on Motivational Jumpsuit in terms of capturing their ferocious live sound on the heavy tracks, think of something like Planet Score, has pretty much disappeared on Cool Planet. I don't know if it's because they were in a new studio where Mitch and Demos weren't around to add additional parts, but some of the rockier numbers here really sound thin. The wormwood of the title refers to an herb that is sometimes used for medical or, hundreds of years ago, magical purposes. It's also associated with the planet Mars, hence the wormwood Mars of the title. In a 17th century handbook for physicians, wormwood was mentioned as being a cure for mice and rat bites, as well as for treating cholera not to mention more arcane uses such as curing melancholy in old men, making covetous men splenetic, and curing the right eye of a man and the left eye of a woman. Second to last song is Ticket to Hide. This is not just a second to last song on the record, but it's the second longest song on the LP, clocking in at three minutes and three seconds. For most of the six reunion records, Toby was the one turning in the longer songs, mainly because his feature more instrumental passages. Conversely, I think that Bob's songs were so short during this period just because he was playing to the abilities of the guys in the band. Without a virtuoso player like Doug Gillard in the group, the songs from these half a dozen records were short and spare. There were hardly any solos, and most of the riffs came from Toby, while Bob stuck to power chords. This is also a bittersweet song, since seeing as how Bob torpedoed this lineup during the Cool Planet tour, putting together a new band for 2016's Please Be Honest shows, this is the last time that Toby's appeared on a GBV record. 
And for me anyway, that's sad to think about, since Toby was a large part of what made so many of GBV's greatest records great, especially the stuff from the early 90s. But of course, just because Sprout's out of the band doesn't mean he's stopped making music. He's currently recording a new LP, and his 2017 album, The Universe and Me, was amazing. I also saw him in San Francisco on that tour, and he sounded great. So he's still around and making music, and as much as I enjoy all the records the band made after this one, ones that didn't include Sprout, I'll always miss his presence on GBV LPs. The title here is of course a pun on the Beatles song Ticket to Ride, which was a single from 1965. And while that song was about the dissolution of a relationship, in this spare song, Sprout's talking about a ticket to disappear from the world. It's about solitude, not heartbreak. Towards the end of the song, Toby trades his acoustic guitar for an electric, repeating, it might get louder. Though this ends up being sort of ironic, since it never really does, in fact, get much louder. Instead, the song just fades out. It's a nice touch and a fitting way to say goodbye to the best foil that Bob's ever had. Last song on the record is Cool Planet. Idea is rare with your face, but now you see well. It's a cool planet, cool and flat, cool down and listen up. This song is an absolute blast. And even though the first 20 seconds are kind of plain, when the song goes into that second section, Bob singing, in your strangled discontinuation on the surface of the wall, the song just erupts. And while I stuck up for Kevin Finnell in the last episode, and I still completely respect him as a person, Kevin March here turns in an absolutely amazing performance on the drums. Plus, the fact that the LP was recorded in a proper studio means that the drums also just sound good in a way that a whole lot of the reunion records and the early GBV LPs just don't match. And while I've compared some of March's performances to Keith Moon from Pollard's favorites, The Who, here he's actually much more disciplined than Moon. His fills are really precise and he's right in the pocket. It reminds me of when former Faces drummer Kenny Joins joined The Who. There's footage of him from 1979 rehearsing with the band and they're playing Sister Disco and he sounds great and controlled in a way that the Manic Moon, for all his skills and charms, never was. When at a minute into the song, the instruments drop out and Pollard yells, Heroes do matter, insects do scatter, I always get the chills. It's an absolutely fabulous moment, especially when the guitar and the drums return and Bob's still singing about heroes and insects while on another track he's repeating the lyrics from the second section and March is just pounding away in the background. Towards the end of the song, as it begins to fade out, Pollard gives the LP's title another mention, crooning, It's a Cool Planet. It's a really fun way to end the record. Okay, that's it for the show. In two weeks, we'll be looking at GBB's 22nd record, Please Be Honest. It marked the surprise return of Guided by Voices with Bob playing all the instruments. Until then, subscribe to the show, leave a review, and God bless the Monument Club. Dis on the sex level.